Welcome everyone for the Christmas edition of our vlog series. We are recording this right before Christmas. My name is Filippo Lancieri and I'm a postdoc here at the ATH Zurich Center for Law and Economics. So today I'm very happy to introduce you Professor Amit Zak, who used to be a postdoc here and is just about to start a new position as an assistant professor of law at the University of Amsterdam School of Law. Uh, Amit works on empirical legal studies, he actually used to be my office mate, so it's a real pleasure to host him here. And today we're going to talk about his recent work called The Court Speaks But Who Listens? Automated Compliance Review of the GDPR. Welcome, Amit. Thank you very much, Filippo. Okay, so let's jump right in. So why don't you summarize or the headline findings of your study? Headline findings, okay. So um, on the more technical level, I would say that we managed to automate a compliance review for the GDPR in a specific, co specific context of uh, international uh, transfers of personal information. So that's one achievement, um, uh, which is not always easy to do. Now, in terms of the actual findings uh, that we investigated, we asked the question of whether apps in the mobile app store, specifically the Google App Store in Spain, um, responded to a court decision, the European Court of Justice decision, um, that made the transfers from the EU to the uh, US illegal overnight. Uh, and we wanted to see whether uh, the apps responded and how fast they responded and so on. And we basically found that they didn't respond uh, very well, let's say. So a um, couple of months after the decision, we see levels of around 75% of non-compliance. And almost two years after, there's still around 45% of our sample that uh, doesn't manage to uh, become compliant to the decision. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. So let's try to break it down for the people who are watching us at home. So you're talking about the SHREMS 2 decision, which is their... their First Shrem's decision, second Shrem's decision, we are expecting a third Shrem's decision at some point. So, yeah. so what, is Shrem, what is the Shrem's 2 decision? What exactly the court decide? Yeah, so uh, again, as a bit more broader perspective, this is GDPR, this is privacy laws in the European Union. Um, and under this uh, regime that uh, became effective in 2018, uh, international transfers of personal information of EU citizens um, ha has to be... Uh, um, occur under certain conditions. Um, one of the possibilities is that the EU Commission decides that the specific country has laws that are equivalent to the GDPR in terms of protection, and in that case, it's almost like it's an EU country, and transfers could flow freely. Uh, of course, one of the biggest uh, trade partners of the EU is the US. In terms of uh, data flows, it's, uh, I cannot exaggerate this. This is really a, a trillion dollars uh, economy. Um, and that the court de decided that the decision by the EU Commission, specifically that decision that's called the privacy shield, that the framework that allowed these transfers, mm -hmm. uh, is a note. Um, the technical parts of the decision is more that the fact that um, the regime in the US in terms of intelligence and other laws that, uh, that requires information, the EU uh, courts decided that they are not compatible with the GDPR protection. So for practical reasons, most of the transfers of data from the EU to the US became illegal almost overnight or something? Technically, there are other legal bases for this, but it's, it's quite uh, rare. Okay, that's really interesting. And so what I think is what's really groundbreaking about this article, which, which you mentioned a little bit in the beginning, is that it's, it's the combination of a legal analysis with a technical analysis. So let's try to look at one of, it, one of each time. And so... Uh, what, let, let's go through them. So what, what, how do you do your legal analysis and what are the main findings there? So in terms of legal analysis, I think that, of course, you have to understand the GDPR. You have to understand uh, what makes uh, an app compliant with the GDPR, um, the legal basis, as we said, to the transfer. Uh, there are specific articles that deals with this in the GDPR. Um, and we had to categorize the policies of those apps based on groups of legal basis. First of all, do they transfer to the U.S.? Do they de declare the transfer to the U.S. or other countries? We have to decide whether uh, they are using the shield as a legal basis or not, if they have other justification for the transfer. This is the type of legal analysis we're talking about. Now, 
you can do this by humans, right? By lawyers. That's what we've been, done for years. But if you want to scale this up and do this um, in, with the thousands and maybe even millions, uh, which is the world that we're living in, you want to use AI technology to classify automatically this type of, of uh, policies. And, and you are basically looking at like 10,000 apps. Yes, this is the, the, the popular, the most popular apps uh, at the Google Store back then in Spain. So 10, 10K um, um, apps. But we actually have studies, um, I didn't mention that this is part of a, a year and a half project uh, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation uh, that was uh, funding my postdoc here. Um, and over there we did this several projects that their whole goal is to bring these tools, technical tools, into legal analysis. Um, and we have other papers on this area. Okay, so let's break it down a bit better for, for our listeners back home. So, so you, you complement this with a technical analysis. So how exactly do you do this and what are the main, the main findings there? Okay, so um, first of all, I have great collaborators from the University of Madrid, from the Technical University of Madrid, polytechnical, I should say. Many and techniques. Yeah. Many techniques they have. <laughs> and there's great co-authors there that uh, helped us a lot. So uh, David Rodriguez and Jose Maria uh, Ramiro both uh, great collaborators. I had uh, written it down so I don't get, get the names wrong. Um, so what we did in terms of technical analysis, as I said, many of the, of the law uh, um, studies in this area would be able to analyze the policy. And even the more advanced ones would be able to analyze, um, to classify, for example, to scale up the policy analysis. But what we wanted in this paper was not only to get uh, to what companies are saying they are doing, but what they are actually doing. And for that part, uh, the team in Madrid was uh, instrumental, and they basically, uh, with their techniques, were able to conduct something we call a man-in-the-middle attack, which is to intercept the, the communication between the app and the server that is sending the information. So we are able to see not what policies are saying, do we transfer data to the US, do we rely on the privacy shield, but we are also able to see if they're actually transferring personal information and what is the personal information they are transferring, like emails, IP addresses, address, and so on. Um, and we could see this, first of all, when you just start up the app, you download the app, you start it up, but also with some random, like a, a monkey type uh, behavior of the app, then you could see what, what they're sending out. Um, yeah, and we use those measures to um, estimate compliance in, in well, regards basically to Basically, you find not a lot of compliance, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and what were it, so you said in the beginning, so in the beginning there's like 70% non-compliance and after two years, what were the numbers again? So around 45%. Uh, this is the numbers that we identify. Of course, there are limitations. I have to be uh, clear. Uh, we are not, it could be that some apps use encryptions that we are unable to detect. It could be also that uh, the classification task that I described earlier, it has false errors. We do try to optimize it in the way that uh, it, it prevents that it's, let's say, it's a lower bound estimation. It's not exaggerating what we're seeing. Uh, but I do feel the tools are um, quite advanced already to start in going into the next phase of, of using these tools in law. And you mentioned that this connects to your broader research about in this collaboration with computer scientists to try to have this automated review of, of privacy compliance, right? To understand really at scale what's happening. And one day we were chatting and Amit told me like, oh, that you can summarize the result of his findings, many of his findings in a way that uh, if, if you saw these levels of non-compliance in like street, like car driving, you basically would never drive on the street. So, so do you think that's a fair, is this, this still a fair summary or how do you? Um, I think that the most observations we see in this realm of computer science and law, these, these are the numbers we're seeing. We're seeing that the digital world is like a wild west. It's, it's, we, we're seeing that the, raw, the, the laws don't have the, the impact that we believe they have, um, which is a, a big uh, question mark for us lawyers. How do we design the next laws? How do we um, enforce the, the current laws? Uh, and in terms of the broader agenda, yes, so I have collaborators from ETH as well, computer science, and they're also very encouraged, uh, very excited about this type of, of uh, research. So it's great to have these partners here in ETH. Um, and then we're doing other types of automatic review of other uh, elements of the GDPR. But uh, I want to just mention one thing that um, the, the fact that we're using privacy laws, in some ways, this is just a case study. You can think of this as the, the next revolution in law, DMA, DSA, AI Act, all of these new regulations, wave of regulations coming into the EU. You can think of automating compliance in all of these areas. And not all 
uh, articles of the law, but some. And to a lot of people want to do more interdisciplinary work. So in your experience, what have been the main challenges of having an effective collaboration of computer scientists to have yeah. something that delivers for both sides? If I'm being honest, it, oh yes, of course, you have to find a common language. You have to find a common interest. That's clear, but I, I, I felt that the, the collaboration was almost natural. Um, I think in many cases, computer science, they, they focus on the measurement and the technique, but they're also interested in the bigger question of life and social sciences and so on. It's not that they're doing this because they really just care about this small, tiny application of machine learning. They want to make an impact. So in, in that case, the combination is quite natural, and we bring to the table these problems that come up from modern society and that uh, we're basically uh, compatible to each other. We bring these questions from social sciences and, and law, and then bring, they bring uh, unique methods of identification. But also in empirical legal studies, you know, we bring the econometrics, we bring the, the analysis, the empirical analysis, so we could match this quite nicely. In the end, you get the data set, but then you have to analyze it. So. Yeah, I was gonna say, and what, so the, what is the most rewarding part of this collaboration in your opinion? Really like doing, being able to do groundbreaking work or interacting yeah. with different people. There's also a different way of thinking about research, right? So that's, this must be interesting. Um, so I think the most, the, the, for me, I'm a, I'm a bit of a geek in this, uh, so I, I like figures and graphs and, uh, you know, so when you have a new project and, and there's a graph and it shows something new that you learn about the world, I'm, I get excited. Every time, every time we had team meetings, I mean, I mean, would show up with a new graph and he was just like really happy that he had been working for one month in that graph and I was like, that's what I yeah, did the past yeah, month, yeah, you know? Yeah. Like. yeah, you know, you work a lot and then you have one graph, but I don't know, I, I get excited about these things. Um, but uh, seriously, um, I think that the opportunity that we have now uh, to bring these tools into law and also the next step is to bring these tools to regulators, bring evidence to them, but also actually bring the tools to them because everything we do is, is kind of, uh, you know, it's open code, it's open data and when it's not sensitive, of course. Uh, so we try to share these resources, it's not for us. Uh, and so the, the idea is really to go to the next stage and, and see how we improve people's life, not just, you know, uh, having some figures in a, in a paper. No, yeah, that's, that's a great place to have a, my final question. So, so what do you think are the main policy implications of your findings? And in particular, if you were to be, if you were a regulator, what would you do differently than what you do now? That's a, that's a big well, question, okay, but you're tough. Um, so first of all, I say that um, I have also other two collaborators on this paper from, from ETH, uh, my professor uh, Stefan Bechtold and, uh, and uh, Pablo Wei, who, who helped me as well here. Um, I, most of the times I will leave these questions to Stefan, but I, I'll try, okay, I'll try. Uh, it's good that you remind me though. Uh, so I think in some ways I'm, I'm about to give up on, on privacy protection. I, it sounds dramatic. But I think we're doing things uh, inherently wrong. Uh, I think that in the in Europe, in the European Union, we put a lot of weight on the responsibility on the user, and we put less weight on the actual actors and their economic incentives. Uh, and I think what we're seeing here is that GDPR created markets, markets for uh, services, and these services, like any other firm, they have one agenda, and that's to make profit, and and uh, and that's okay. But we have to think of these problems when we create these new laws with these new systems. Uh, and I don't think we did a great job. Uh, it's not that GDPR is a failure or something like this. I think it, it has many uh, great qualities. Uh, and also, let's remember, this is one of the first framework uh, that tried to regulate a, a big chunk of the dig digital world. So that's a huge challenge, a regulatory challenge. Uh, so we learned a lot. We're, we're still early in, right? We have five years in, but I mean, this and is going to be here for 20 years, 40 years, who knows exactly. how long So I think we, 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 we can improve with the tools. I think in terms of the actual regulation, I think we have to start thinking of enforcement as part of designing the laws. Uh, and it's, it's also maybe in, in terms of specifically about privacy, we have to think about how do we change the weight in terms of the responsibility of the user to protect himself or herself and the, the responsibility of the firms uh, to create a safe environment. So thank you again, Amit, for being here with us today. Above all, thank you for being an excellent office mate for the past two years, two years and a half, and a, an amazing team member of the CLE. You'll be really sorely missed here by everyone, but we really wish you all the best in the new phase of life now as a, as a professor. Now we should call you Professor Zach next time I see you. Thank you very much, Filippo and Stefan and, and all the CLE team for, for inviting me here today and uh, for a great time here.
really a pleasure. And to all of you watching us from home, thank you for watching us or listening to us. It's uh, have great holidays, have a great end of the year, and we hope to see you again next year.